Hello and welcome to Security Scan. I am Vishal Dahia and today we will discuss the likely fallout of a war on North Korea. In the recent days, tensions on the Korean peninsula has risen over North Korea's nuclear weapons program, with North Korea and the United States exchanging a flurry of strong rhetoric, each threatening military action. North Korea has been increasing its nuclear capabilities and missile technologies in absolute defiance of the international community for a long time now. The latest important developments in this crisis have been North Korea's tests of long-range missiles on 4th and 28th of July that may be able to reach the American continent and the United Nations Security Council's unanimous decision on 5th of August to impose new and harsher sanctions on North Korea. The risk of this current standoff escalating into a full-scale military confrontation increases if Kim decides to launch new missile or nuclear tests and President Donald Trump then decides to send aircraft carriers, submarines and troops to the Korean Peninsula in an attempt to force Kim to the negotiating table. Further escalation of the situation may spell the end of Kim dynasty, but will be disastrous for South Korea and Japan, who might have to bear the burnt of North Korea's firepower, both conventional and nuclear. So why is the young ruler of North Korea persisting with his ambitious nuclear weapons program in the face of international condemnation, sanctions and threats of an overwhelming response by the United States? And with his fire and fury statement, is President Donald Trump actually being predictably unpredictable or has this added fuel to the fire? Also, what might be the implication of a full-scale military conflict involving Kim's North Korea armed with nuclear weapons? And is there a way out of this crisis? For discussion on this, we have with us a distinguished panel of guests in the studio today. Let me introduce you to them, starting with Mr. Rajiv Sikri, former Secretary, Ministry of External Affairs, and uh, we also have with us Mr. Ajay Lele. He's uh, a senior fellow, IDSA. And we also have with us uh, Mr. Sandeep Mishra, an associate professor of uh, School of International Studies in uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University. Let me begin with you, Mr. Sikri, and straight away the first question which comes to mind in the present situation is, all of us can look at it that uh, the situation is pretty bad. But is there a chance, do you see there, there being a chance of a further escalation of the tensions between uh, North Korea and the uh, United States, which might lead to a full-scale military conflict? Well, in the last day or two, actually, there's been a slight scaling down scaling of down. the rhetoric, which is to be welcomed. Uh, I don't know how much further they can ramp up the rhetoric. So uh, I think this is uh, a bit for show mm -hmm. because neither the United States nor North Korea really wants to go to war. Mm -hmm. At least, uh, I mean, I know that the leaders in both countries are quite unpredictable, uh, but uh, surely uh, there is a, some sense of responsibility and recognition of the enormous uh, human, political, and the military consequences of a conflict breaking out, it would completely upset the whole equilibrium in that part of the world. Mm -hmm. That cannot be to any country's uh, advantage. So, no, I don't see the rhetoric going up. Mm -hmm. And uh, I do hope, there is no uh, indication that I have, but I do hope that uh, there is some back-channel contacts or diplomacy uh, which is underway to find a way out that would uh, be an honorable exit for oh, all sides. For, for both sides in this yeah. particular situation. Let me bring in uh, Mr. Lele out. Uh, Mr. Lele, do you believe that uh, uh, President Donald Trump is, is moving away from that uh, strategic patience which the previous United States administrations have shown in case of North Korea? We've seen, uh, you know, uh, North Korean regime uh, building up on its nuclear uh, technologies, nuclear weapons stock, stockpile and other missile technologies over the decades, uh, despite repeated reminders, repeated sanctions, repeated harsh uh, uh, comments from the administration, uh, United States administration and the United Nations as well? Uh, I think if you see the current pattern, uh, Trump administration is saying that from strategic patience, they're shifting towards strategic accountability. Mm -hmm. uh, so whether you like it or not, it appears that Trump's threats are working. 
because for all these years, rather for last couple of months after Trump has come to the power, he has taken very bold but definitely stupid decisions like getting out of a climate deal, so on and so forth. But interestingly, what he has said, he has stuck to his words. And okay. that's where the fear appears to be emerging into the minds of North Korea and particularly in the minds of China. Because the day Trump said that we will uh, go ahead with fire and fury, immediately Chinese Premier had a telephonic conversation and the tempers have started coming down. Because North Korea had raised the tempo saying that we will uh, get into the Guam Island region yeah. and fire four missiles. After that, the type of language which Trump is using, I think that has also created certain amount of uh, doubts into the minds of a North Korean leadership as well as the Chinese leadership. You never know, he may go ahead with it. Okay. And I okay. think that could be one of the reasons why these two people have slightly mellowed down and backed down. Okay. Now, there is going to be a military exercise which is going to take place. One has to really wait and watch how US and South Korea uh, takes a decision whether to go ahead with that. Uh, if they don't go ahead with it, I think it will be a very good thing. It will uh, bring the tempers further down. Okay. Uh, let me bring in uh, Mr. Sandeep Mishra here and uh, taking it from uh, where Mr. Lele has left, uh, that the Trump uh, administration's uh, stand and specifically the statements which have been given by the president himself seems to have worked. But another viewpoint is that those statements themselves might add fuel to the fire, which might, you know, uh, make uh, the North Korean regime a little bit uh, more uh, nervous, uh, pushing them uh, for the, uh, you know, taking, uh, moving ahead and uh, taking the first step. Yeah, I think I agree with you, uh, because it seems to me that uh, rather than actually looking into United States and its tough posture towards North Korea, mm -hmm bringing results and North Korea is probably a bit actually uh, uh, blinking first kind of thing. In my opinion, it seems that actually Trump had been there for almost more than actually six months. And from very beginning, he had been making all the gestures. He is making uh, very strong statements. He's but been consistent with his viewpoint. Cons I've, I've, I've heard his statements where, which he made in 1999 and 2003 as well. Uh, almost very, similar statements. Very true. So that's what I'm thinking. But I think North Korean behavior doesn't change by that. Uh, I think the change of North Korean behavior, I see the source is actually South Korean recent, actually in May, South Korea had a new president, new president. called Moon Jae-in. And Moon Jae-in has been supporter of engagement policy with North Korea. And overall his policy, because he had been trying to use all the, you can say, formal and informal channels mm -hmm. to reach out North Korea. And I, I basically, yesterday itself, probably one of the boldest statements South Korea made in recent decade, saying that, look, nobody is allowed to have a war on Korean Peninsula without our permission. In the sense, this statement was not meant for North Korea. It was, I, I, I or most of us actually, mm -hmm. we, we consider that this is meant for Americans. So basically, he has been trying to engage North Korea, but North Korea was not trusting South Korea in the mm -hmm. beginning. But he had been trying to probably prove, rather, 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 reach out North Korea and say, look, we can have some kind of engagement, we can have some kind of negotiation, and if you don't trust us, let's see how I'm actually uh, making a very strong s statement against America. So I personally feel the source of North Korean, like some change in North Korean behavior, mm -hmm. I basically attribute it to South Korean President, the okay. way he has been quite statement-like, quite you can say you can say considerate, quite you can say uh, he has been actually probably responsible for change of North. Uh, okay, let's let's take a viewpoint from uh, Mr. Sikri here. Mr. Sikri, uh, do you uh, agree with uh, what uh, Mr. Mishra is saying? One that uh, you know the change in behavior or the change in stand, uh, even if uh, it's a little bit uh, change, that is due to what the South Korean. Uh, uh, stand has been in the recent past. And more importantly, uh, do you also agree that uh, the fire and fury statement uh, is is uh, not the right way to deter North Korea at this point in time? I think um, North Korea, uh, South Korea's uh, point of view needs a little better understanding. Okay. They don't feel, as I understand it, as much of a threat from the North as the Americans or the Japanese do. Because they say they are our brothers and, you know, they won't really bomb us. And uh, number two, the South Koreans have a certain anti-American feeling also. Okay. Even though they are in a treaty arrangement with them, 
I, I, there is a sense that you know their armed forces are under joint control led by the Americans. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I think that uh, the South Koreans understand perfectly well that they have to live with North Korea, that even without nuclear weapons, North Korea can obliterate huge parts of South Korea just by sheer artillery fire. So they don't want any uh, conflagration uh, there. Mm -hmm. And as uh, Professor Mishra has pointed out, the, uh, this, this statement is significant. In fact, it is something that should be music to the ears of uh, the North Koreans. Okay. Because uh, here is a rift, a potential rift which is emerging between, between the US allies and, and US and, and South, South Korea. Korea. And that is something which they want. They want the US troops out of South Korea. Uh, they want these treaty arrangements uh, to go away. So uh, that's why I said at the beginning that if a conflict arises, who will go with, with whom is not at all clear. Okay. Because you have the South Koreans who have their point of view. So is, 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 an, is a extended implication to what you're saying is that uh, the rhetoric which has been uh, you know, enter, involved into by the uh, US president, specifically the fire and fury statements, they, this is uh, not the right way to deter no, North Korea as of I, now? I think as has been pointed out, this has added some credibility to the American threats. Okay, as uh, Mr. Lele was yeah, pointing out. Th th this has added uh, credibility and it has put pressure on China. Okay. Because it is, if there is a conflict on the Korean Peninsula, China will be a very affected country. Okay. Because you will have then American troops, American missiles sort of right next door. Mm -hmm. And the Chinese, if it, it, it may be recalled, entered the Korean War in 50 because they didn't want the Americans on their borders. On their borders. So North Korea is a buffer for them. And they wouldn't like North Korea to disappear. Because then they are confronted with an American ally right at their doorstep and American forces. That okay. creates problems. Okay, uh, some, something like that, uh, which uh, you were also pointing out, uh, Mr. Lele, in the beginning. Let's rewind a little bit. And one important question, which uh, uh, you know is missed always when we talk about uh, the situation in the Korean Peninsula, is because the situation becomes so tense that everybody starts talking about the factors of the situation, the solutions to the situation is the very fact that for decades now, the North Korean regime, be it uh, Kim Jong-un now or Kim Jong-il before him, have been persisting with the, uh, their uh, uh, policy of developing nuclear weapons, missile technology, despite international pressure. So one, why would uh, the young ruler still persist on that right now, wherein it seems even China has moved one step behind? You see, as far as nuclear weapons are concerned, it's altogether a different ball game. Mm -hmm. The moment you have got a nuclear weapons, today you see uh, the position of a North Korea. North Korea has reached to a position where they are bargaining with US from a position of a strength. It would have never been thought of by any other country that they will bargain with the US from a position of a strength. So this it gives them a bit Exactly. Mm -hmm. So it is essentially happening because of the presence of nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. Because they fully understand the way Saddam Hussein was eliminated, the way Libyan problem was handled, the way Gaddafi went off. Even uh, you go back to the history to uh, South Africa and other places also. The moment you give up nuclear weapons, your presence has got no meaning. So the leadership could be easily eliminated, the way Gaddafi had uh, seen the last day of his life. Mm -hmm. So on the similar lines, definitely the young leader is not interested. So he wants to debate, uh, discuss, and come on a negotiating table from a very position of a strength. strength. And from that point of view, nuclear weapons are extremely important for him. As far as US is concerned, their entire global policy of a disarmament comes to a standstill if they allow North Korea to handle nuclear weapons. Because today, if they allow North Korea to handle nuclear weapons, we never know how the proliferation will happen tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So from that point of view, US is extremely concerned that they want to denuclearize it. Okay. But North Korea is definitely not going to uh, at least uh, blink so fast. Okay, uh, let me uh, bring in uh, Mr. S uh, Professor Mishra here and uh, uh, taking it a little bit further, although uh, all of you believe out here and, uh, uh, you know, everyone, uh, every commentator on this particular topic believes that uh, this rhetoric will, will eventually die down if not uh, in uh, the stipulated time frame which we expect uh, may take a little longer. But if push comes to shove and it 
The situation is escalated into a full-blown military conflict between North Korea and United States. As uh, Mr. Sikri was pointing out, the situation is not clear as of now as to who stands with whom. China has already said that uh, if North Korea strikes first, we will not come to the aid. But if they are under attack, then we will come and help them. South Korea, as Mr. Sikri was pointing out, is not very comfortable with uh, the kind of rhetoric which uh, United States is involving itself in. So is the picture a bit jumbled up as of now? And uh, we might see a different picture if the situation escalates. I think uh, if we look at trajectory of this escalation mm -hmm. and uh, overall the course, it seems very clear, you know, both the parties, America and North Korea, they have been making very, very strong statements. They have been talking about actually, uh, like they, they, are, they are doing some missile tests here, mm -hmm. some sending some bombers over there. Mm -hmm. But both the party, they are not crossing the Lakshman Rekha. There's a red line. Mm -hmm. And basically the red line is that who attacks the next one first. Okay. And the whole scenario will change accordingly. In the sense if North Koreans, they attack Americans, probably Chinese, China would not be in a position to save North Korea. Then Americans are going to retaliate. And it would be very difficult diplomatically and otherwise for Chinese to come in rescue for North Korea. But similarly, if Americans, they attack first to North Korea, then things become very different. Then China is going to rescue North Korea. So I think that's why both the party, they have been doing everything possible, but actually they are not attacking each other okay. in action. So that part, if we are clear about this idea that both the party, they are making the tricks, but they are not crossing the red line, mm -hmm. it means... Crossing the red line is going to make big difference. And both the parties, till now, they have restrained themselves. And that's why very strong statements, because they know that other is not going to cross red line. And actually, they know that the, they are also not in a situation to cross the red line. So in, in my opinion, the future course, how this escalation would finally mm -hmm. flare up, would depend on who is going to cross the red line. I think both the parties, they are clever enough not to do so. And that's why my hope, my optimism comes. That okay, probably again. South Koreans and Chinese and others... They may come in and they try to have some kind of... Innovation. Okay, again, definitely, uh, it's, it's the optimism on which everything is uh, built up right now. But in this situation, uh, Mr. Sikri, where do you see Japan, uh, uh, you know, because it's, it's an important player in the region and it does uh, carry the risk of uh, being caught in the crossfire in this situation? Well, Japan evokes very negative feelings among the Koreans mm -hmm. because it was an occupying country for many decades. Definitely. And this uh, whole... Uh, 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 comfort women issue is also an important one. So uh, Japan is disliked both by the South Koreans and the North Koreans. Uh, and, you know, and yet both Japan and South Korea are allies of the United States. United States. This is a, a, a problem. They're, on the, they're in the Jap same axis. Jap so Japan does feel uh, vulnerable. And uh, they have, because of the treaty commitments that the United States and Japan have, uh, they uh, feel that the United States uh, should come to their assistance were they to be attacked. But uh, I think that uh, it will not come to that. Okay. I, I'd just like to bring in one other element here. Mm -hmm. And that is that North Korea, or Korea in general, is a very small country located between larger players, be it China or Japan or the United, United States, States. Or in Russia, and they don't really trust anyone, the North Koreans in particular. The North Koreans also have a feeling that, you know, uh, Kim Il-sung, uh, he was actually the leader of, he led a genuine Korean uh, resistance movement in the war. And then after the war, thanks to the Americans working through the United Nations, he was prevented from taking over the Korean Peninsula mm -hmm. and unifying it. So that feeling remains, I think, in the Korean mind. And they consider the South Koreans as puppets. And for many decades, in fact, the South Korean regime was a puppet regime mm -hmm. till the late 80s or so. And North Korea was doing much better than the South in many respects. It's also much more resource rich. So these are some of the psychological factors at work. Because here is the grandson of the founder. And, and these are some of the thoughts which are in the minds, I think, of the young leader as he battles with the United States. Oh, okay, let me bring in uh, Mr. Lele here, and you were talking about how uh, you know things uh, might happen if the push comes to shove, and uh, 
uh, Professor Mishra was also pointing out. But in case of North Korea specifically, the command structure uh, it seems to be very tightly knit. You know, the nation uh, seems to be closely uh, uh, well knitted together. Uh, some call it uh, due to the issue of a factor of fear. You can even uh, term it as patriotism, or maybe you can even term it uh, the isolation. But uh, the unity aspect which uh, exists there in the North Korean uh, uh, side of this particular conflict, will that, uh, does that rather also act as a deterrent uh, to uh, all the other players not pitching the rhetoric too higher? You see, there are uh, two ways of looking at it. One is that, uh, at least based on the television images, which are definitely selective, one can see that uh, the population is with the leader. Mm -hmm. uh, but the leader has also ensured that there is no other power center emerges. Few days back, and he brutally, had ensured brutally that, that exactly. Well. Uh, few days back, he had ensured that his half brother got killed uh, into Malaysia. In Malaysia. So, from that point of view, definitely he has consolidated himself over the years. During last six years, it is said that he has done more number of nuclear tests combined together than his both father and grandfather. grandfather. So he is in total control of the situation at one hand. Other hand, China has got major concerns if the conflict breaks over there. Because their problem is that there will be an influx of refugees and the Chinese dream and the way China is emerging or has emerged mm -hmm. uh, definitely will go down the drain if they have to uh, accept so many people. Second thing is that falling down of North Korea will definitely make a unified Korea. And as Ambassador Sikri was saying, that now there will be a major presence of the United States over there. So that is also not in interest of China. So right now China was uh, basically giving a lip service to all the United Nations sanctions and all that. Mm -hmm. But as of yesterday and day before, China has said that they are going to ban the coal, ex coal imports, iron ore imports mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. seafood imports, I think. So China is slightly now ensuring that the conflict will not break down. Okay. Because USA, it appears that is pretty clear. They have already said that, yes, we have identified 12 missile silos over there, mm -hmm. and we are going to go and launch an uh, attack on them the moment something goes wrong into uh, islands of uh, Guam. Uh, so from USA's side, they are not looking at a war per se. To my mind, uh, may not be a very correct comparison, but what happened in 1981, uh, when Israel launched an attack on Israel nuclear sites. Mm -hmm. So something akin to that, USA that, is that might happen. Exactly. That, that could happen. Or at least USA is putting that as a plan A for them. Uh, so they don't want to go to a war. They will say that your but strength But you can drag them to the negotiating your, table your, in one way or the other. Your strength is missiles. So we will ensure that your missile sites are no longer there. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, closing comments from uh, you, Professor Mishra. Does there look like a situation that this is going to come down pretty soon? I think uh, I'm quite hopeful because, you know, uh, there are also rumors, especially actually if you read South Korean newspapers, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, uh, probably the joint military exercise, which is going to be happening between America and South America Korea, and South Korea. On 21st of August, they may scale down the, spa they, they, they may scale down intensity as well as span of the joint military exercise. And that may give actually some positive signals to North Korea because North Korea has come out with one step, actually, positive step. So maybe if they can respond by reducing some intensity of joint military exercise, okay. there may be possibility that both parties, they could have some, you can say. In that. Uh, do you agree, uh, Mr. Sikri, uh, final comments? Well, I want to say that uh, China is in a bit of a spot because they have an important mm -hmm. party congress uh, coming up. And uh, any uh, provocative step by Trump, a war there, could have huge domestic consequences for Xi Jinping. Xi Jinping. At this and he time. would not definitely want that he at this He stage. would not want that. So this is pressure on China. Okay. Second, from our point of view, if China's attention is more diverted to North Korea, which is much more important than anything mm -hmm. which happens with us, I think it will divert their attention away from the India border. And, 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 and it, will, it would definitely give us some and, relief. And any upheaval in that part of the world uh, could have uh, huge geopolitical consequences, including possibly Japan going nuclear on something to which Trump has talked about. In a okay, so clearly it seems that, uh, as our panelists are pointing out, uh, the situation might seem very, very tough and the tensions are escalated uh, because of the high-pitched rhetoric from both sides, but looks like that uh, 
both sides does not want a situation wherein a um, full-scale military conflict is the only option left and definitely both sides would also be looking forward to some way out of this particular situation. So let's wait and watch as to what happens in the Korean Peninsula in the next few days. We'll come back with a different set of guests and a different topic next week. Till then, keep watching Rajasabha Television.